coming up on Sleep, Eat, Perform, Repeat. On the other hand, there's been cultures that I've walked into that I'm not going to mention that are completely the opposite. You 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 feel like you're you know in detention, and you know even when has it been Fika, you know that they've got a fantastic academy system where they train. They're in the same building as the professional players where they just have a standard of everybody says hello to everybody and you walk past in the hallways small little things those are things i've seen in great teams as leaders we're responsible for the energy we bring you know we're like thermostats when you walk into a room you can control the temperature i've always said that as the leader goes so the culture goes so the culture goes so the team goes so the team goes so the results and the experience goes Hi everybody, Alistair McCaw here. Please check out my new book available on Amazon on the 1st of December, Habits That Make a Champion. This is my episode on sleep, eat, perform, repeat. Enjoy it. Welcome to Sleep, Eat, Perform, Repeat with your hosts, David Clancy and Kieran Dunn. This is a podcast about high performance. What we are striving to achieve is to figure out what makes high-performing individuals tick, why they do what they do, and why they are successful. Enjoy a journey of stories, lessons, and learnings. Today we spoke with Alistair McCaw, Human Performance and Team Culture Coach. Alistair is recognized as one of the world's leading figures in maximizing human performance, mindset, team culture, and leadership. For over 25 years, he's worked with numerous Olympians, Paralympians, world champion athletes, Grand Slam champions, Fortune 500 companies, NCAA colleges such as LSU, Duke, and the University of Minnesota, Nissan, along with football clubs such as Rangers, Benfica, and Paris Saint-Germain, and author of five best-selling books, Alistair is also a 29-time marathon finisher. You heard that right, 29 times. And former five-time world championship competitor in the sport of duathlon, which he actually explains to us today. We spoke about his journey from Ballymena, Northern Ireland, to South Africa, Johannesburg in particular, and to Florida, where he now lives. And why champion-minded became his calling after a very successful personal sporting career. He unpacked what separates the best of the best and why joy and fun is so important in elite team environments, but also when children are participating in sport. That must be the goal. Alistair leaned into coachability, work ethic, attitude and hunger and why these ingredients are vital. Please check out his podcast, upcoming book, which we'll share in the show notes and his coaching mentorship program. Alistair McCaw, thanks very much for joining us today. How are you doing, sir? I am great. It's great to be here. Thank you so much for having me. And Alistair, for everyone tuning in and listening today, give us a sense as to where is home for you, also where you're from, and, uh, and share your background for us, please. Well, I'm sure uh, by my accent, it will probably be a little bit difficult because it goes in and out of different um, uh, different uh, dialects and so on and so forth. But I was born in, in Belfast, Northern Ireland. Um, we left there when, when I was five, uh, immigrated to South Africa, uh, which um, I was there for 20, 22 years, I think it was. I then was based in Europe for a while and uh, ha- have now been in the United States for 15 years uh, in Florida. So home for me is about 20 minutes south of West Palm Beach. Uh, mm-hmm. And I'm sure many know that uh, or where that is. It's about an hour I'm probably about an hour, 15 minutes from Miami. So I'm in between there. Many of us know where it is and many of us are jealous of it as well. Especially this time of the year where the clocks are turned back and, and it's getting dark early. I mean, I know what I, I know. I, I lived in Europe. I lived in London and Amsterdam and I know exactly uh, how it feels. So you've had quite a journey. We've been looking into it. Where did it all start in terms of looking at champion mindsets and winning mindsets for you? You know, for me, be, being a kid, playing a lot of sports, being with four brothers, I was the youngest. There'd always be World World Cup uh, matches going on in the back garden, uh, tears and fights and so on and so forth. So that was my, my foundation to start with. Toughened me up a little bit, I think, because like I said, I was the youngest. And it's very fascinating that, that uh, and I'm, ju- I'm, I'm jumping the subject a little bit here, but you guys would know this more than me is that, um, you know, there's studies being done is that that 
kids and families that go on to play a high level of sport or professional, they were usually the, one of the youngest uh, or, or near the youngest, you know, because the, the brothers and sisters before had been used as an experiment or uh, with the mistakes uh, of coaching and, and parenting and uh, the younger ones benefited. But that's where it started for me. Uh, brought up in South Africa, as, as I mentioned, where, you know, in school you get to play a lot of sports. So I was very fortunate sometimes to play seven, eight sports uh, in a year in school. You can just imagine the Southern Hemisphere, uh, Southern Hemisphere sports being rugby, cricket, uh, tennis, cross country, track and field. Uh, those were just some of the sports I'd played. But sport was always in my blood. Um uh, I wouldn't say I was the most talented uh, uh, young uh, young athlete. I always had to work hard to get into teams. I had to put in extra practice, um, and I think that's where champion minded was really was really born. Was all those years ago uh, was understanding how what would give me the best chance of getting into the team with not having the most skill or being the most talented, uh, and you know that would come down to the things of work ethic and commitment and uh, effort and attitude being coachable. Those are the things I caught on to at a very, very young age. So with writing the book champion minded, um, that's really where it was born was, you know, you don't have to be the most talented or the most skilled uh, when you put in, when you put in the hard work and show commitment, those are the things that can, that can get you to a great level. I really love that you know, about showing up and having that coachability here to show up to train to learn to get a little bit better you know just a little bit of a share here my son michael he's he's five and saturday mornings 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock he's he's learning tennis lessons about six weeks in really loves it it gets a lot of fun really is enjoying it Working on the skill development side of things of course but he's just there because he's actually enjoying it and that's why we're doing it when do we should we look at those other skills kind of what ages should we be considering maybe mindset and then we've had these sort of conversations with some like Graham Betchart. Would love to get your your sense, Alistair. Well, you know, in my job uh, in, in consulting athletes, coaches, leaders, um, you know, I'll have sometimes parents that'll that'll contact me wanting, uh, you know, mental toughness or mindset sessions for their kid. And, you know, I'll ask them, well, how old is your kid? And uh, the kid's maybe eight or 10 or 11. And I'll say, well, you know. <laughs> At that age, I hope all they're having is fun. The last thing they need is mindset and mental toughness coaching at that age. Uh, so, you know, I'd rather say, rather spend the money on on yourself, on being a great sports parent. I think the money would would, would uh, have more value there, to be honest with you. But, you know, up until the age is really of 12, 13, 14, um, fun should be, you know, fun should always be the the, the main objective of playing sports, you know. Uh, some of the best athletes, when they compete well, are having fun. Uh, in fact, you know, we just saw that New Zealand uh, women's won the the Rugby World Cup. And, you know, one of the interviews I did for my book, uh, my new book, was with Sarah Harini, who's, who plays for the New Zealand women. She said, you know, a dangerous player is a player who's having fun on the field. You know, they're, they're not scared to make mistakes. They're experimenting. Um, you know, we fun. saw that. Yeah, great playmakers like David Campisi, if you guys remember him. And, you know, they're, they're having fun out there and they're playing well. So fun is number one, especially at that age that we're talking about, you know, five, six, seven, eight, whatever, up until 12, 13. Um, they should be playing a variety of sports. Uh, as parents, I'm not a parent, but as parents, you know, you should be offering them, you know, to play a variety of sports, to to try I always recommend a team sport and an individual sport because they provide different things for, for the uh, for the kid. Uh, individual sports provide accountability, uh, decision making, ownership, and in a team, learning how to work with uh, with other people is is so important. Is life life skills mm -hmm. later on for work. So you know those are some of the things I think are very important. I always recommend uh, or suggest to parents um is reward the right things what are the right things work ethic uh the champion minded things we spoke about work ethic attitude being coachable reward those behaviors and not the wins and the losses the outcomes it's funny because parents and we've experienced it even seeing academies across professional sports Parents want the best for the kids, but they also want their kids to succeed. So I think a paper by Dave Collins recently spoke, or a few years ago, about 2016, 17, spoke about the five key essential ingredients as well for 
elite versus sub elite athletes in terms of getting there. What are the, and one of them was parents weren't too pushy. So it's a fine line between wanting the best for your kids succeeding. I know David brings Michael everywhere to, he had a hurl in his hand, a rugby ball. He will be gymnastics. He'll be everything. What's the best way to stop David treading that line or overstepping that line of wanting to push him to be his best, but stepping too far across it? Yeah. As a parent, as a coach, we should always be growing the love of the sport that they're playing. Um, So, you know, giving them freedom to, to be creative, giving them freedom to be, uh, you know, to, to play with their friends and not always have structured practices is an important one. You know, this is what's happening here, especially in the United States. Everything is structured. There's always a coach or two on, on the field or on the court or on the track and kids are not playing anymore. They're not having fun anymore. And because uh, of technology and the generation we're in today is that there's more distractions. So, you know, we're saying, well, why aren't the, uh, as many kids on the street playing, playing football and, and rugby and whatever it may be uh, is because there's so much distraction, obviously with iPads and, and computers and, and Xboxes and all this stuff, there's more. So that's, what's taking away that uh, th- their time from all the, that free sport, for example, um, you know, but it's it's just creating the space for them. Again, it's their journey. It's not our journey. Uh, you know, as parents, as coaches, we're providing the tools, the support. But I've always said the athletes that have gone on to, to bigger things, majority of the time have been self-driven. They've been self-motivated. They love what they do. Uh, I've always said the three qualities of, of a great athlete, and I've been doing this for 30 years now and, and seeing uh, athletes from the age of 10, you know, make it and and some who haven't. So I've been able to watch their development over 10, 15 years, uh, working in, in the Dutch Tennis Federation, working with, uh, you know, US sports here as well, is is the ones who really love it. So the, those three things were passion and a hunger to succeed. They love what they do and they're hungry to, to do well. Uh, the second one was discipline, which I believe begins in, in the home. And the third thing is attitude, mindset, the ability to handle handle pressure situations. Those two things were key with regards uh, going to to a higher level. Yeah, well, there you are, David. You've, you've the ingredients now. Okay, I've written them down. <laughs> um, if only it was that easy. <laughs> you've obviously understood those, and obviously working with athletes of a really high level. But you know what? We're looking at your program: twenty nine marathons and duathlon. So, you know, you've got experience on a personal level. Talk to us a little bit about that. I mean, we've got lots of recreational and professional runners listening to this track and field athletes. We've had a good few on the podcast over the years. What is it about those endeavors uh, that maybe you, you've leaned into? And what is it that you've learned about yourself from those? Um, growing up, uh, my first love was tennis and wanted to be a professional tennis player. But you know, with the expenses and the costs, uh, you know, we just couldn't afford it as as a family. So at the age of 13, 14, um, you know, took up took up running a little bit more in the track and field team. I still continued to play tennis, but realized I wouldn't go into a further level because of the coaching I needed and the travel. Uh, loved running. Um, and it progressed from there where it became the under 16 South African champion on on the in the five kilometer. Uh, at that age, I had a I had a time of fifteen oh three on on the five kilometer. So uh, I had some uh, I think maybe lucky genes there as well. My mom was a was a great runner as well. Um, then I I got injured I think around seventeen eighteen and and um, someone suggested why don't you do a little bit of cycling to you know to just keep yourself fit while your running injury is healing. I think it could have been Achilles or something like that. I thought, hey, I like this riding thing too. This is pretty cool. Why don't why don't I do a duathlon? And duathlon for anybody who's listening that doesn't know is is basically triathlon without the swimming. So it's running and biking. Um, became two time South African champion in that, uh, and then competed in five world championships in in duathlon, uh, finishing second in two thousand and two. Um, and then at the end of my duathlon career, I. I started to run a few marathons. Um, I do regret that I was never at peak fitness running a marathon. So I'll never know what I could have done um, because I'd stop once I'd stopped my duathlon career. And I think my last race was actually in Dublin guys. It oh, was, wow. uh, yeah, it was in the park, your, your main park there. Phoenix park. Yeah. 
yes, yes. That was one of my, my last races, which I won. Um, so it was a good, good way to bow out. Oh. And uh, I started tr- running marathons about two years later, but I was, I was already uh, far off my best. Um, so I do regret not knowing what I could have really, have, really have run. So speaking directly to you, you've coached and you teach world-class mindsets, but you clearly had one to go to five world championships. What do you think, and maybe the three aspects you mentioned, were the key ingredients to make you or to create the world-class athlete that you became? I think it gets back to those three things I mentioned, you know, hunger to succeed. I was always hungry to succeed, maybe too much sometimes, which I would overtrain, overthink. So, you know, sometimes going full time in a sport can be a detrimental thing where you just got all day long to think about it. And and this is what I encourage athletes, rugby players, whatever it may be. I've got a rugby professional rugby player on my mentorship program where, you know, I said, you've got to be doing something at least four hours a day. That's not rugby, Uh, be it learning a new trade, studying, whatever. But don't be sitting at home, twiddling your thumbs, watching TV, waiting for your next rugby practice. You know, that's you know, you got to be setting up your next career. So. Um, hunger and passion, discipline. You need to have self-discipline. Um, I'm like I was like anybody else. I'd wake up some mornings not feeling like it, and and you go out and you do it. Cold, rain, whatever it may be, dark. You go out and you do it. And um, and again, you know, uh, uh, that third thing as well is is the ability to handle pressure moments, uh, the mindset to push through. That was important as well. So. Um, those were three attributes that really helped. And from your experience, what are we looking for, Alistair? You know, those real ingredients that really make the difference. You know, when you think of those good amateurs, great amateurs, great professionals, but to the next level, what are the separators? I mean, to really get those athletes to fulfill and exceed expectations, to really capitalize on potential, but make it into really high performance. You know, what would what should be looking for for the next level? Yeah. Um, you know, talent might make you good, but it's all those attributes we've spoken about, the champion minded attributes that will make you great. So I'm sure you guys have seen, and, and a lot of our listeners as well as really talented juniors or talented people that didn't make it. Um, you know, what can also be very detrimental is being very good in, at what you do at a very young age, mm-hmm. because you get a false perception of where you are. Uh, we know that the best 12, 13 year old rugby player is probably the one that's had the growth spurt that's that's you know head and shoulders above the rest you know and then the other kids eventually catch up at 15 16 we see it in tennis we see it in sports like this where the best 11 12 year old hardly ever makes it to being the best 18 year old or even worse they've quit the sport by by 15 16 because they they haven't lost they've never learned they, they didn't learn how to fail they didn't learn how to lose they were so good so you know failure is an important part of success failure is an important part of learning how to be better in anything you know failure is not the opposite of success it's a part of success so if you're very very talented and good at a very young age that's nice but you know it's important to learn how to lose how to how to compete when the chips are down so to say i think those are the things that are essential in becoming a great athlete later is that you've got to go through adversity difficulty learn how to fail uh those are even you know injuries and navigating and coming back stronger when questions have asked of you even right exactly and that's something i wrote about as well is that do you have a can do or can't do attitude Mm -hmm. all right so you got injured okay well that's that happens in sports especially when you're you're you know you're pushing your body all the time okay so you can't do uh weight bearing work okay good then we can work on your core we can work on your shoulders you guys would know this more than me as well it's that can do what are the things we can work on at the moment that can be better while we rehab uh, something else? Yeah, I think we've probably seen that in working with when you have an athlete who you nearly, you nearly know is going to succeed through rehab, they're nearly seen as an opportunity. They're nearly seen as, well, if I can work on this, I can get as stronger than I was before and actually go back to a platform above where they, where they had left off. So we've definitely encountered that in our careers anyway. But I was just jumping into, and I might be robbing some, coaching and I know you wrote about this in your books but for that failure what's the best process because looking back on a situation where you've failed or you've done badly or you've had a bad performance it can be painful so is there a process that you encourage maybe it's a professional rugby player in your mentorship group to do when things don't don't go to plan 
I think it's always good to have, uh, like I call a backup team. So have good people around you is essential. Two of the most important decisions you can make, not only as an athlete, but as a human being, are the people you choose to surround yourself with and the environment that you choose to be in. So those are two important things. So, you know, getting back to our last point of what we were talking about there, uh, people like yourself and the athletic trainers, physiotherapists, you're you're a critical and uh, probably the most important people in the process of an athlete being injured. You're the ones that are spending time with them. You're the ones that are encouraging them, motivating them. Uh, uh, you know, the can do instead of can't do attitude. Uh, because there's, as you know, there's a lot of dark days when you're injured as an athlete or if it's a serious injury, you're questioning your your future. Uh, we know that more than six months out of the sport can start to become pretty, pretty dangerous for the athlete where they almost get forgotten about. The team has moved on. They've, their replacement is, is playing well. All these things that get into their head when they're out of the sport, I think people around you are, are, are critical to encourage you, uh, to support you. And, and keep saying, listen, we're not just going to make a comeback. We're going to we're going to come back stronger than ever. You know, a setback is a great opportunity for an amazing comeback. I love that bit you're talking about there, the environment. And I know we've spoken about individuals here, but let's look at the team setting. And you've you've got loads of experience working in team settings, you know, Benfica, PSG, Rangers, different organizations. How can we get a sense as to the culture there? I mean, a lot of us are always interested in that. Can you feel this place is high performing? Is there a sense? Is there a taste? Is there something in the air? What is it about knowing when you walk into a building, when you open up a door that look, the foundations are here for success. I mean, Kiran, we've spoken about this an awful lot. Alistair, what are you looking for? You know, it's it's funny. Um, doing some work with Glasgow Rangers when when Stephen Gerrard was there and Michael Beale and, uh, you know, when I when I arrived at the front gate of Milgarvie, the uh, the training ground in, in Glasgow, I already knew what the culture was um, without even walking but walking into the building. The Security guy was super friendly, walked me to the gate, had a super chat with the receptionist while I was waiting. Uh, when I walked through the hallway, uh, people greet you, they're smiling, uh, you know, walk past Mor Morales, players like this where they say hello. So already I felt a culture within 10 minutes. Those small little things of people are nice, people are kind, people are welcoming. As small as it might seem when I was at Benfica, exactly the same situation. On the other hand, there's been cultures that I've walked into that I'm not going to mention that are completely the opposite. You 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 feel like you're, you know, in detention. And, you know, even, you know, when I was at Benfica, you know, they, they've got a fantastic academy system where they train, they're in the same building as the professional players where, you know, they just have a standard of everybody says hello to everybody and you walk past in the hallway, small little things. Those are things I've seen in great teams. One thing that's really stood out for me is, and we spoke about this in the beginning, I think as well, is great teams are having fun. You look at at, at, at Liverpool um, of the last three, four years, for example, of course, they're having a little bit of a tougher time at the moment, which every team goes through, regardless what your culture is like, you will go through adversity. Uh, things come unexpectedly. I think it was Wayne Smith of the of New Zealand again, who's now coaching the the, the, the women's team that just won the World Cup spoke about the fact that that humor and fun and laughter is present in winning teams. Uh, that That's something that's apparent. They're having fun w while they're playing. It's serious. They want to win. They're working hard. They're working as hard or harder than other teams. But there's there's an element of, of just enjoyment of fun that has to be in winning teams. And, and that, that, you know, that, that, that goes into the office, that goes into the physio rooms, that goes into everywhere. That is culture that you enjoy being there and you enjoy working with, you know, your fellow colleagues. It's funny, that really resonates with us, uh, I think, Kieran, doesn't it? And the fact that, you know, Alistair, we're working with a good few companies here in the corporate sector, you know, mostly leadership groups. And the feedback we get is that they, they tend to obviously love and enjoy the workshops. But what really makes them that bit more memorable, I think, is when there's those light moments, the kind of lightheartedness moments. You know, it's not too heavy. It's not just content. It's not serious stuff because these sort of companies, you know, multinationals have a lot of high pressure meetings and talks and seminars. So can you bring joy to an environment like that? Can you can you lighten up the mood? Can we change the energy? And I mean, we hear people saying it helps reduce stress. They feel a little bit more creative then. 
and even improve things such as flow. Yeah, one of the best things we read in the prep for this was, I think you said a meeting with you spoke with Carlos Quiros, former Man United manager, and he had mentioned that people don't remember your drills or your training sessions, but they remember the energy that you bring. Why was, why was that so profound? I think we're building into it now, but why is energy so important in creating that fun culture and mood? Yeah, you know, as a leader, and, and Carlos Quiros is one of the nicest people I've ever met. I, I met him back in Johannesburg when he was, um, many probably won't remember this, he was the, the head coach of the South African uh, football team, I think maybe 99, 2000. I can't remember how far back it is now. Uh, what struck me was just what a, a humble, genuine man he was. I got to chat to him as well. I was working privately with with a, a team member of the South African team at the time, so got to know him. But, you know, at that age, that was that was 20 years ago, so I was still a little bit green, thought I knew it all, and I was talking about this drill and that drill, and he was like, Alistair, people won't remember your exercises and your drills. They'll remember the energy you brought to the session. That's all they're going to remember in 10 years after they've worked with you. And uh, it always it always stayed with me. You know, as leaders, we're responsible for the energy we bring. You know, we're like thermostats. When you walk into a room, you can control the temperature. I've always said that as the leader goes, so the culture goes. So the culture goes, so the team goes. So the team goes, so the results and the experience goes. So, you know, that's something that's so important for, for leaders to, to remember is that you set the tone, you set the thermostat, you are the example. You can't be asking your players or your team to have a positive attitude and be energetic and proactive, but you're not yourself. Example is everything. What about that moment, as you said, when teams that are on the cusp of greatness face adversity, right? They go through that moment, right? They go through that little bit of loss of form, like you said, Liverpool, they go through challenges, you know, new management, new, you know, using Champions League final. How can you find that energy and say, you know what, well, what got us to this point is is still good and the process and the systems are still, we still have the same players. Mm -hmm. Just this is, let's not get overly consumed so that the energy can change. How can we just, this is just a blip. What can we do in those situations? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and every team goes through it. I've never walked into, in my 25 years of visiting cultures and teams, I've never walked into the perfect culture. It doesn't exist. Uh, every day we're, we're challenged with dynamics and behaviors and moods. And, you know, everybody's going through, through something. That's why there's no perfect culture that exists. And at the end of the day, your culture is your people. And your people is your culture. You know, when we're talking about, you know, as you just mentioned there, David, maybe bigger teams like Liverpool and so on and so forth, the best advice is to shut out the shut out the outside noise. Um, so we know that social media can be a big distraction, and and these TV shows in the morning and so on, breakfast shows and sports where uh, that can be a lot of distraction. So you know to shut out the noise and focus on working on the things that need to be worked on. Like you just said, there um, we've had success before. We're going through a difficult period right now. And, you know, a, a great team culture is not judged on, on success. A great team culture is really judged on adversity. How do you handle adversity? Strong team cultures are able to work through adversity and, and challenges. Weak team cultures break up, blame each other, complain about the situation, and so on and so forth. So really, you know, the, the best thing is really to shut out the outside noise, um, uh, you know, work together. Great team cultures, there's a high level of togetherness, especially during times of adversity. And I think something, again, you've mentioned and we've read in the preparation was the importance of consistency and winning mindsets don't just happen like you can't play the piano because you, you buy one and you go sit down to it in front of it. The importance of consistency, how do you articulate that to clients and to teams who want success right away? Uh, I have this saying, and I'm sure you guys are getting sick of my quotes by now, but <laughs> you know, the average do it sometimes. The good do it most of the time. The great do it all of the time. And consistency comes from building great habits. And habits take time to build. You know, I have this 99 theory is that it takes at least 90, 90 days to build a habit and only nine days to lose. So if you go off the rhythm of doing, I'll give you an example. Every day I do 100 push-ups. I have my push-up bars in my room. If I travel, I'll take them with me in the bag and put them on the on the hotel floor. I'll get up. I see them. I do them. I'll start with maybe 25, go and do something, come back, do another 25, for example. And it's become a habit. 
I've become consistent at it over over time. And, uh, you know, that's just a small example is that consistency comes from building great habits at the end of the day uh, of, of, again, of, of doing it when you don't feel like doing it. And that was, of course, number two, after hunger and passion is discipline, the discipline to do it when you don't feel like doing it. Successful people do things that other people don't feel like doing or don't want to do. That's really what it comes down to. Talk to us about your coaching, Alistair. You know, you're working with that rugby player or you're working with one of us or... What is it that you're maybe where do you start? What are you, you know, what are you hoping to achieve? What does what does that look like? When I start with somebody, um, I usually ask them, what is it you want? And I know it's a very direct, straightforward question, but I can't help you if I don't know what you want. And that could be anything. That could be wanting to get into the national the, the national team. It could be wanting to change jobs, for example, with uh, one of the clients I just uh, worked with just before I got on onto the podcast here of wanting to change positions, wanting to change jobs, for example. The first question is, what is you want? The second question is, what do you need to achieve this? Uh, what resources, what people, environment, et cetera. And number three is, why does this matter so much to you? So we start with those three basic questions. What is it you want? What do you need in order to achieve this? And number three, why is this so important to you? Because the third question, why, is that when you don't feel like it when you're demotivated after uh, it's like a new year's resolutions after a month, Hey, this is becoming boring or stale, or I'm not enjoying this as much as I used to that your deeper reason why will be your, your, your motivation. So did I feel like getting up at four o'clock in the morning to go ride my bike in South Africa on the road that was dark, dangerous, uh, cold sometimes in winters in, in Johannesburg? No, of course I didn't. I would have loved to have had another two hours of sleep. But because my 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 purpose, my why was to be at the world championships one day to possibly win it one day was so strong. That's what pulled me out of bed. As as we know, and there's a famous quote as well, is that motivation can be fleeting. You know, where you feel like it and you don't feel like it. It's not motivation isn't enough. You need to have a deeper reason why you're doing something in a purpose. Building into that purpose and the why and the question of what do you want? It is a direct, straightforward question, but I bet you that a lot of people don't know the answer when you ask them. Yeah, it's different for, for different people. And it is a fascinating thing of how many people don't know what they want. It's almost like getting that question. Have you ever had this question to yourself of who are you? Like, well, <laughs> you know, and the first things we go to is what we do. Yeah, I'm a consultant, author, leadership. No, no, no. That's what you do. Who are you? And of course, it's getting very, very, very deep uh, when you get asked that question. Um, I still don't know how to answer that question, to be honest with you, of who am I? Um, so when it comes to purpose, I would say, and that's a great, that's a great thing you brought up there is more than more than 50% 50 of people don't know what their purpose is. And you lose motivation by not having clarity on what you want. You do because you don't really know what you want. It's like a gray area. So it's easy to lose motivation. That's why that's why that third question, why is this so important to you? What you want is um, is, is critical to to uh, the long term. And here, perhaps this is something for the three of us to consider a mini reflection for us to do. And uh, when we have a quiet moment, I recently attended a, a session with the Arate Syndicate, you know, Ed Milet, Andy Frazella, and they talk a lot about purpose kind of why you're here and ed was talking about this this thing that he learned years ago and he often does it with people that he coaches when he says tell me about you and when he works with people i'm going to tell you about you it's really good for building confidence obviously and helping instill that sense of purpose but you know alistair i'm looking at you and you've got a lovely way about you you know your body language you always we already feel we trust you genuinely you know it's the eye to eye contact and engagement you've got a great smile that kind of warmth and yeah, no, I and thank you for 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 those those words. But I'm still very critical about myself. Um, I don't. I'm never. I'm never the finished product. Mm. Uh, I always type of. I have this thing that if you look back to who you were five years ago, I hope, I hope you cringe, and I do of the person I was five five years ago. Um, to know that I'm learning, growing. Uh, evolving, I need to make sure I'm a different person to to who I was five years ago. Um, you know, if I looked at the way I coached even 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I cringe. 
of maybe how I spoke to some people, how I behaved. I, you know, I, I even remember once or twice my behavior was pretty poor in speaking to certain athletes where uh, I, I called them up. Uh, there was an athlete that, that I, that, that, you know, I regretted my, my behavior, what I said to them in the heat of the moment. And I got in touch with him about a year ago uh, after many years and apologized and gosh, it was hard, but it was the best thing that I did because it was on my mind for every time I'd see his name, uh, he was a professional squash player. I'd think of that day. So yeah, uh, trust me, I, I don't get, get things right uh, all the time, make a lot of mistakes, still do. And I think that's where self-awareness and self-reflection is so important. And I think we've done a good bit today and looking forward, what, what's next for Alistair and what, where is he looking to make mistakes in the future? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're not making mistakes, you're not making anything. So I'm making a lot of mistakes. Uh, right now, really, really busy with just getting my next book out, Habits That Make a Champion, which should be available the 1st of December, hopefully, yeah. on Amazon Worldwide. So uh, I'm actually waiting as we speak for FedEx to pitch up with the proof copy today um, to give the go-ahead. So that's consuming a lot of my time uh, right now. You're allowed to go off early if the bell goes. <laughs> that's, yeah. that's important. Yeah, you'll, you'll hear the dog, don't worry. <laughs> Alistair, everyone that comes on the show, we're always interested in unpacking and sharing their story and ultimately wanting to learn from you. And the question we always finish with is, quite simply, what does high performance mean to you, Alistair McCall? Consistency. And that's something we, we we touched on is, and I'll say it again, the average do it sometimes, the good do it most of the time, the great do it all of the time. So I would say high performance comes down to consistency. Alistair, thanks very much for giving us your time today. We're really grateful for you tuning in all the way over in there in Florida. We're uh, really jealous of your beautiful weather you're probably having there. It's pretty cloudy here today. We're going to share, obviously, information on your upcoming book in December, mention your coaching program. And just genuinely wishing you the very best. You know, stay fit, stay healthy. Please stay in touch. If you come over to Europe again, give us a shout. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Sleep, Eat, Perform, Repeat, a story of high performance. This was brought to you by Howora, a whole person wellbeing company founded and run from Dublin, Ireland. Find out more at howoralife.com, spelt H-A-U-O-R-A life.com. Please rate, review and share the podcast. Some people want it to happen. Some wish it would happen, others make it happen. The GOAT, Michael Jordan.